Well, good to see you. Yeah, it's good to be seen. <laughs> Can you tell me um, your grandfather's name and the name of the award that he received? Jo John Chipman Kerr. He was, uh, well, conflicting reports. He was somewhere between the ages of uh, 19 and 25. I think he was 25 years old when he, when he got the award. And here's a, a copy of it. I don't know if you can see that or not. It's the highest award you can receive for valor in the in the British Commonwealth. It's a simple uh, a simple cross, but it it is the most prestigious award you could get for for pulling off a plucky act and living to talk about. Well, not all, most of them. Well, I shouldn't say most, but a good portion of these were. Uh, awarded posthumously to a, a lot of our boys. One of the reasons I wanted to interview you and get this whole story is not just because it's connected to us, which is a really cool thing. Yeah, but it's kind of special. It is, um, but also because um, he was a resident of Port Moody, which is not far from our school. That's right, he, he got there, uh, he settled there after World War II. And before that, he was farming. In a place called Spirit River. Him and his brother uh, went up there when they heard they were giving away land. And they got a quarter section each right beside each other. And the rules were you had to have something built, some kind of a structure built on the property. So what they did is they built a, a 22 by 22 foot log cabin and they put it right on the boundary between the two properties so each brother slept on his own property his ingenuity continued to follow him throughout his life i th yeah he was pretty sharp <laughs> there was a funny story that laura relayed to me about how they left for war and how they left they just kind of up and left do you want to show oh. out that story roland and uh, and Chip were partners in this conglomerate. They were they were very close, and they they traveled and and then when the war broke out, they thought, well, we better go do our part. And he nailed a a piece of paper to the door of his of their cabin that that read, "War is hell, but what is homesteading?" And he nailed that nailed that to the wall to the door, and they got on their horses and they off they went. After they signed up, there was some training and then they shipped them off to England and within a couple of months, they were in England. So tell me uh, whereabouts they were deployed. Near Corselet, which is near the Somme. So back in 1916, things weren't going well for the boys in the Somme. Was that the context for him um, doing everything that eventually ended up with him being awarded this? Well, no, what had happened is... Uh, well, they, what they used to do is, is, I don't know a great deal about trench warfare, thankfully. So what happened was he, uh, him and another guy. Now, my, my granddad was kind of uh, impatient. We had a short fuse, which got him into a few scraps throughout his life. And he was there in the trench, and they've been sitting in the trench for, let's say, two weeks, which was fairly normal. And they're up to their knees in mud. And every time you poked your head up to get a breath of fresh air, somebody take a shot at you. So it was a little testy. So what, 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 how it was explained over the kitchen table was him and his buddy decided to go visit the Germans. And so they crawled out and they crawled across what they call no man's land, which is a stretch of land between the two trenches. And so you're going under barbed wire and you're going in, foxholes and you're going over and under all, through all the mud and and they got up to where he could could hear the Germans talking and uh, he looked around to his friend to, to decide what they're going to do next and his friend had turned around and gone back because his gun was full of mud and so he's out there all by himself he he decided well I've come this far and so he crawled a little further until he got up to the close to the parapet, the edge of the trench, the German trench, and he stood up and he started shooting. 
And anyway, he, uh, the Germans were kind of shocked at this. What is this guy doing here shooting it? Up? And they, 62 of them surrendered. They just threw up their hands and said, we're finished. And they'd had enough of that trench probably anyway. So anyway, they surrendered. And so he motioned them to get out of the trench and start marching back. And all this time there's other, uh, other German infantry shooting at him, but he's not getting hit, which is kind of surprising because the Germans are pretty good with a rifle and they had pretty good equipment, but he, he come out of that one. <laughs> and him and him and two other guys, two other guys ran over when they saw what was going on. They, they got out of the trench and came to give him a hand. So they marched these 62 Germans back to their trench and they, that stretch of German trench, 250 to 300 yards of it, they captured it, which was a real boost because, well, things weren't going well anyway for the, the British, English, the English and Canadian troops. They're having a bit of a go of it. So this was a real, uh, a real win, as it were. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a photograph of uh, a painting by A.Y. Jackson. Now the government got a hold of A.Y. Jackson and said, "We want you to do a portrait of some of the some capture the war on canvas, as it were." And his first assignment they, they gave A.Y. Jackson was to paint a, a portrait of my grandfather. And Jackson's response was, "I do trees. I don't do portraits. I've never painted a portrait in my life." And they said, "Well, here's your chance." You've got two weeks. So for 10 days, they're upstairs in a pub, upstairs in, in a studio that was set up. And uh, they'd paint until he got tired of sitting like that and until A.Y. Jackson got tired of whatever they do, you know. <laughs> for those yeah. not familiar with A.Y. Jackson, can you give us a little bit of a... Uh, well, here's, here's one for the kids. How many people, how many artists were in the group of seven? I'll, I'll, I can tell you, but they'd be cheating. Very famous Canadian artists. They would capture Canada on canvas. And if you happen to come across a group of seven a painting in a garage sale, grab it. I love <laughs> you it. Can, you can retire. <laughs> he was my granddad was also involved in uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a, uh, an event called the Christmas Truce where the, the Germans and the, the uh, Commonwealth soldiers got out of their trenches they quit shooting at each other and exchanged Christmas gifts on Christmas Day they would they'd be singing Silent Night in German but the tune was the same yeah. So the Commonwealth guys would be singing along and pretty soon they'd, they'd poke their head up and nobody shot at them. So I don't know which side got up first. Somebody got brave enough to get up and walk over and, and they were exchanging gifts. And my granddad, he, he, all he had with him was, was the pack of cigarettes. So he gave it to this one guy and, and this guy gave him a, a great big chocolate bar, which he thought was perfect. So, but it was quite a, Quite a time, quite an event. And then they were ordered back to their trenches and start ordered to start shooting at each other again. And how silly is that? But that's that's politics for you. He he wanted uh, in some of his conversations he talked about how he he really liked Canada, and he wanted to do what he could to be part of Canada. <laughs> 